Good morning. Well, almost not morning. If you'd open your Bibles to Luke 5 and stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're continuing, actually we're concluding uh, the fifth chapter today. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along using the screens to my right and my left. I've left my Bible in the sound booth in the back, so I'm going to use the screens to my right and to my left. Beginning in verse 33. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast? Well, the bridegroom is with them. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. Amen? Amen. Take a seat. I've been asking each service this. Let me ask you a question. Uh, Who here really likes change? (laughs) Few people like change. I do not like change. I've never really liked change. Thank you, Alan. (laughs) I uh, did not like change. I never really liked change. Um, when I was a kid, I went away to like a summer camp. And when I came back, my parents had bought a fax machine. And I had a little meltdown because of a new machine in my house. I was a normal, regular 10 year old boy. I don't think people in general like change. And I think we think on things that are no longer with us, and it makes us sad. How many of you have raised or been raising kids? Yeah. And there's things you miss, right? Some of you guys have kids that are too big now to pick up. You remember holding your babies or holding your infants? You remember the way that your babies laughed? Do you remember that? You miss that. You remember having a kid that would say a word incorrectly, but you really liked it? For society's sake, that, that kid needed to learn to speak correctly, but you missed the way they would mispronounce a word. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And we could all sit around and talk about the things we missed when our kids were real little. Um, and if I said to you, the thing I miss is that little hermetically sealed trash can that I put diapers in. <laughs> You'd be like, what? what? Like, I miss that thing. Like, Nobody misses that thing. I don't miss that thing. I don't miss the space it took up my house. I don't miss the reason that I even had it. There's nothing, I don't miss changing the bag inside it. I, nothing about it do I miss, right? Change is hard for us to, I think, appreciate a, in, a, in a good way. And I think that sometimes it can be hard for us to accept change. But most of us could be able to point to things in our life that have changed. And that change has not been bad. It's been good. It's been beneficial. The sort of change that we are looking at in this passage is the most significant and marvelous and powerful and important change in all of human history. And it affects all people. You've probably been with us for a while, has been working through the Gospel of Luke. And specifically over the last few weeks as we've been working through the fifth chapter of Luke. And on either side of Easter, Pastor Mike preached through the passage with the paralytic. Who remembers that? Mike, you paying attention? There's a man who couldn't walk, and his friends who have faith bring the man to Jesus, and Jesus forgives the man's sins. And then the scribes and the Pharisees are there. Those guys again, they're frustrated. They say only the one God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He looks at the man, he says, get up, grab your mat and go home. And here's what happens. 
Immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Jesus' ministry is, in a certain sense, undeniable. I think we think back to what it would have been like in the first century and assume that everyone alive just, just, just like believed in all kinds of miracles. When they saw a miracle, they thought, Ah, oh, that's the sort of thing that happens. It's not the sort of thing that happens. They were blown away. They had to admit that in some sense, a sense that maybe they didn't fully understand, God was present and active in the ministry of Jesus. And then the next section, Pastor Zach preached on last week. It's the conversion or the calling of Levi. What's his other name? All three services, got it. Super pumped about that. So we read that passage. I want to read the whole thing to you now. Zach preached it last week, but it's on the heels of the healing of the paralytic. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, what? Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so we get this narrative that I think is as miraculous as a paralytic being made able to walk. We get the narrative of the conversion of Levi from a tax collector to a party planner. And Zach talked about tax collectors last week. I want to reiterate it. Tax collectors were both hated and evil, not always the same thing, but in their case it was true. The Roman Empire had conquered the region that Jerusalem and Israel was in, and they would rule that region in two ways. One way was they would send their own governmental agent to play a role as an authority in Israel. His name's Pontius Pilate. And they'd hire this indigenous local guy, they'd raise him up, and we know him as Herod. And so they would use a combination of their own guys and guys from the area. And the way that they collected taxes was they would allow locals to bid to be tax collectors. They would tell the Roman government, here's how much money I think I can get, like a contractor making a bid. But bear with me, I love contractors. You guys are great. You're not the same as tax collectors. Do not walk away from today thinking I'm saying that, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying tax collectors would make bids like that. The Roman Empire would pick the bid that they believed was the highest, but also likely to be successful. And so these tax collectors would go around and they would levy the taxes against the people. And they would ask for more than they had bid so that they could hold on to whatever extra they had. And they would do this with the power of the Roman authority or the authority of the Roman Empire behind them. I was recently on the East Coast. You know what I hate about the East Coast? everything. No, no, no. The thing I hate most about the East Coast is also here. It's just, they're everywhere in the East Coast. Uh, Toll roads. Do you guys like toll roads? Every time I'm on a toll road, I'm like, don't I already pay for this? I hate pulling up to the little uh, toll booth guy where he's like, to be on this road that you're already on and you didn't know you were going to be on, that you already pay for with your taxes, you need to give me this amount of money. So I've never in my life do I want to break the law more than in that moment. <laughs> now just imagine for a second that guy's deciding how much you pay and there's no rules and he's one of your buddies from your neighborhood and he doesn't like you. And he's like, for you, it's $28. Do you want to go to Bakersfield? 
You see, these people are personally hated. They are hated because they are collaborating with the enemy. They're hated because they take money from people. They're hated because likely, in most cases, they were corrupt. And Levi, as a tax collector, probably would have been corrupt. And his buddies would have been corrupt. And there would have been a web of deals that they're all making with each other and putting money on the table and all being corrupt together. And each is corruption made the other richer. The text doesn't tell us this, but I've talked to people who've come out of corrupt lifestyles and they say, it's not just like I walked away from my own sin. I had to walk away from the sin of everyone else and no one was happy that I left. There's money on the table. There's deals left unmet. It's not super safe to walk away from webs of crime. Not only does Levi walk away from it, then he invites all the people who were probably mad at him to a party at his house because it's more important to him that they also meet Jesus who changed his life. And the Pharisees see Levi, who is a new man there. They think that's good, but they've got a bone to pick. They say to Jesus, why are you hanging out with tax collectors and sinners? And I want to know, where they have the gall to say that because they are clearly at the same party that Jesus is at. I don't. <laughs> and Jesus answers in a series of parables and Zach worked through the first answer last week. They say, why are you hanging out with sinners and tax collectors? And then Jesus drops a banger. He's like, I came for the sick and not the healthy. It's sinners that need help, not saints. And then we have a series of other questions and parables, and mostly what Jesus talks about over the course of the next three parables is the new sort of thing that Jesus is doing. How there's been a change. Now, I want to pause just for a quick moment and say this. What Jesus is not saying is that the Old Testament is not good or no longer valuable or no longer true. We believe the New Testament is true. We believe that it's valuable, that it is for our instruction as believers today. And we believe it is as much the word of God as the words of Jesus that we read earlier. We believe all those things are true about the Old Testament. Jesus is not saying that. He's saying something else. And when he describes this new life that Levi has, he's also describing for us different qualities of that new life. And the first one, I believe, is this, the quality of new joy. You guys like joy? Yes. Okay, good. You should have new joy if you have new life. Let's read verses 33 through 35 together. They said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. They see that Jesus' disciples are not fasting, they're feasting. They say, why is that? And in one sense, this probably has to do with what we might call public righteousness. They're concerned that Jesus' disciples, unlike their own disciples, unlike the disciples of John the Baptist, they don't appear to be righteous. They're eating and drinking when they should be fasting. And Jesus deals with the issue of public righteousness in another place in the gospel, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. The Pharisees are concerned with public righteousness. Jesus is not concerned with public righteousness. Jesus is concerned with private righteousness. Jesus cares that you do good when no one sees you or ever will see you. But that's not, I think, the main thing that the Pharisees are asking here. That's not the main problem that the Pharisees have with Jesus. The Pharisees and scribes, they see that Jesus is this religious figure, this religious teacher. His disciples 
are not fasting, and I think they're concerned because they believe that fasting is associated with repentance. We have a, a verse like this in, in, in Joel. It says, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar. Go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. They view fasting as a sign or connected to repentance. And they believe this is important because of the predicament that they and the rest of the Jews are in. I've already said that the authority over Israel is Rome at this point. And Rome doesn't believe in Yahweh and doesn't believe in the Old Testament. And they're levying taxes against the Jews. And every single Jew at that time had a similar question to one that we might ask today. Has anyone here ever asked this question? Why do bad things happen to good people? Okay, there's a Christian answer to this question. And the answer is there are no good people. But we'll come back to that. The Jews might more specifically be asking... Why do, good things, or why do bad things happen to God's people? Because this is the land that God gave us. On this land is our temple. We had kings that ruled here. God's presence is in this building that's on this land that God said that he gave us. But we pay taxes to Rome and there's Roman soldiers walking around the region. And there's this guy named Pilate who can execute us if he wants to. And we don't have our own autonomy. And different Jewish groups had different answers to this problem. The Essenes, who are not mentioned in the New Testament, they're a group that just kind of dip. They went out to the mountain. They do weird religious stuff and have all kinds of different ritual washings and their own teacher of righteousness. And their answer was, we don't really know. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to go be religious in the desert. Kind of how it sounds like a cult, right? <laughs> Another answer was that of the Sadducees. Sadducees basically said the way to resolve this is to say actually Rome's not that bad. And they sort of integrated the word sometimes referred to as Hellenized. They became like Greeks or like Romans. And they said we're going to assume that Rome is not bad. And they became Roman-like. You have the Zealots. You heard of them? They had a different approach to dealing with the Romans. Stabbing them. (laughs) (laughs) Military upright. Up. Revolt. All these different groups had different ways of trying to reconcile this problem that they were God's people on God's land, but God seemed to allow some pagan rulers to rule over them. And the Pharisees' answer was this, we are not yet righteous enough for God to intervene. We need the people to grow in righteousness. We need the leaders to grow in righteousness. We need to display this righteousness in fasting and mourning and repentance. And so they see Jesus, who purports to be a religious teacher, and he's got disciples, and they see something like Levi go from being a bad man to a better man. And they're like, why aren't your disciples fasting? We want God to deliver us. We want God to show up. And Jesus' response to them is that God is here now. Jesus is saying, I'm already here. You want to repent and become holy and become righteous so that God will show up, but I'm here right now. The wedding feast is now. He says, eventually the bridegroom will be taken away, referring to the crucifixion until the resurrection. But ultimately he's saying, you're missing the mood here. You're not reading the room very well at all. I go to lots of weddings. Do you guys like weddings? A little bit more mixed, I feel like, than it should be. <laughs> I love weddings. I go, lo- go to lots of weddings now. I see the same things happen at every wedding. I've seen the best man speech 10,000 times. You're almost never going to surprise me. Usually the best man makes some jokes about the groom with varying levels of success. Then he'll say some kind, encouraging things about the groom and the couple and how wonderful their marriage would be. Does that make sense? You heard that right? And it's joyful and wonderful and it's lighthearted and it's encouraging because the occasion is a joyful occasion where something good is happening and it calls for a joyful speech. But the best man got up and said, for my speech, I'm going to list the sins of the groom. And just listed them and then sat down. You'd be like, huh. 
That was kind of wild. <laughs> that guy did not read the room. He did not understand the occasion. His disposition towards what is happening is wrong because he doesn't un understand what's happening, I guess. The Pharisees and the scribes here do not understand the good news that Jesus brings. They want God to come and do not understand that when they see Jesus, they're seeing God. That the righteousness they long for is present in Jesus, that the deliverance they long for is present in Jesus, that the rescue they long for is present in Jesus. And although repentance is a response to the gospel, they struggle to realize that the work that Jesus will do on the cross will lead to far more joy than repentance. Joy is always the right response when you realize what it is that God did for you. I have a note in my Bible that Zach asked me to write down, probably because of the way that my face looks. And it says, smile. <laughs> the gospel is good news. <laughs> and so before I preach, I'm like, yes, okay, smile. I have good news for you. <laughs> over and over again, right? We read this in the Bible. You remember Zacchaeus? If you don't know who Zacchaeus is, we're going to get there. He's in Luke 19. So in 2031, stick around. You'll learn who Zacchaeus is. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down for I must stay at your house tonight. So he hurried and came down and received him. What? joyfully. He doesn't even fully understand Jesus yet. You might expect he'd be kind of afraid of Jesus. If there was a guy that I knew like wanted sinners to repent and I knew I was a sinner and he also could like walk on water and speak and things happen, I might be a little afraid of him. Zacchaeus' response is joy. Then Jesus later in, in Luke is crucified and he's raised from the dead and he ascends to the right hand of the Father and he sends his disciples out to tell people the good news of the gospel. And they go into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And they tell people about this wonderful thing that's happened. And when they do that, people respond with joy. Yes, yes, there's repentance, but there's also joy. Look at, look at. Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them the Christ. And the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him. And they saw the signs that he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was much, what? Joy in the city. Philip later baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. And when they came up, out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. And when the Gentiles heard this, another place, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You see, if the Pharisees' joy was tied up in their freedom from the Romans, then maybe they should repent and fast more. And if our joy is tied up in something besides Jesus, then maybe we are not there yet. And the thing is like, even good things that bring us joy, if that's where our joy is, when those things are taken away, we're left joyless. If our joy is in our marriages or spouses, if it's in our friendships or our children, the success of our children, if it's in our career or our money or our health or any other form of fleeting happiness, we have an assailable joy that can be taken away. And Jesus is actually offering the Pharisees something way, way better than that. J.C. Ryle has a quote when he comments on this section of Luke he says, nothing can happen to a man which ought to be such an occasion of joy as his conversion. It is a far more important event than being married or coming of age or being made a nobleman 
or receiving a great fortune. It is the birth of an immortal soul. It is the rescue of a sinner from hell. It is a passage from death to life. It is being made a king and priest forevermore. It is being provided for both in time and eternity. It is adoption into the noblest and richest of all families, the family of God. A new joy. A new joy. Secondly, in this new life, we have a new exclusivity. Let's read verses 36 through 38. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Jesus is here beginning to describe the newness of what he has come to do. He offers two parables here, neither of which are parts of life I'm familiar with. Never put any wine in any wineskins. I don't really even 100% understand how sewing works, if I'm being honest. I've seen people do it, but conceptually, I don't know. It's magic. Jesus is describing the combination or mixture of something that's old and something that's new. And in both cases, the old cannot accommodate the new. You have a garment that you sew a new patch onto, and at some point the new patch shrinks and tears away from the old garment, which is already shrunk. Or you have new wine, which is going to expand, put into inflexible and kind of old wineskins. And when you do that, when the new wine expands, the wineskins don't expand. They burst and everything's lost. Jesus is explaining that the message of the gospel is not a simple accommodation. It's not an update or an addendum, an epilogue, a sequel It is an entire framework for understanding human life and our position before God. The gospel does not enhance another worldview and cannot be enhanced by any other worldview. It stands alone as the singular way in which we are rescued. The gospel is this, human beings are sinners, rebels, enemies of God. Our first parents sinned against God. And we, like them, have sinned against God. If you're new, bear with me. This is the bad news of the gospel. The world shows evidence of this being true everywhere. It's easy for us to see when we look at other people, the way people have let us down, the way people have wronged us, the way people have sinned against us or cheated us or betrayed us or maligned us. When we examine the contents of our own hearts, we know our own sin and we see our own sin. God is just and he's righteous, he's perfect, he's holy. He'll not stand by and leave evil undealt with. He'll not stand by and leave the guilty unpunished. He'll not stand by and leave injustice not made right. So the justice of God is meant to be poured out on the guilty. That's the bad news. The good news is this. God becomes man, Jesus Christ who does not himself sin, carries no sin, has no sin. He goes to the cross, and at the cross is the moment of great substitution, where the one who has no sin dies for sinners. The wrath of God is poured out on Jesus. He can pay for sin there, and he can grant to us his righteousness. So at the end, when we stand before God the judge, what we present is not our own record of righteousness, But Jesus' record, if in fact we have placed our faith in him, turned from sin and repentance to Jesus in faith. That's the message 
of the gospel. And it's new and it's exclusive. And we are unable to add to it or to change it. These Pharisees and scribes would like whatever Jesus is doing to fit into whatever they're doing. They've come to Jesus with traditions that are not even commanded in the Old Testament. There's one fast commanded in the Old Testament, the the fast for the Day of Atonement. But over time, the rules and regulations and customs in Judaism had grown beyond what the Bible commands. The Pharisees were probably telling people to fast twice a week in order to bring on the deliverance of God. Jesus says you can't sow something new onto something old. You can't pour new wine into old wineskins. One of the fears that I have is that we will often misunderstand what this passage means because of the way we often use it, or I've seen people use it. We hear this is a passage about thinking outside the box. No more old wine, only new wine. We got to be intelligible and clear and wise and clever and hip. We have to be on the cutting edge of culture. Everything Christians do needs to be super relevant and clear for those. We have to always be tearing down the old and raising up the new, reforming at all times. You ever heard anything like this? (laughs) You guys all have like Instagrams, right? Uh, TikToks or Facebooks, Twitters. Don't lie. I know that based on how old you are, you have one of those. (laughs) I'm in my 30s, so I have Instagram. In a few decades, I'll switch to Facebook. (laughs) And if you have those things, you know you have an algorithm that's like catered to you, right? I get ads, listen, I get ads and reels or TikToks or whatever in my app trying to tell me how to be a hip pastor. It's like it knows that I'm not. <laughs> They're like, you got to dress trendy. And I'm like, I absolutely will not do that. They're like, you have to have a great social media presence. And I'm thankful for the guys at our church that handle social media. But my own little account, I'm not doing that. I don't want to post anything. I'd like to look at your pictures and see what you're up to. <laughs> you have to be relevant and clear. And so we have this like mentality in modern evangelicalism, I think in a place like LA specifically, where we're like, we should always be getting rid of the fat, the things that we don't need and be relevant and sharp and hip and clear and interesting so that people will come to Christ. I hear it all the time. That's not the division that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying, not you got to be hip and cool and interesting. He's saying there is only one way to be saved. We read everywhere. Jesus begins his ministry after John's arrested. He comes into Galilee, proclaims the gospel of God. He says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. He doesn't say like reform and believe in the gospel. He doesn't say, listen to these cool things I have to say. He says, repent and believe in the gospel. And John, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts, one of the preachers says, This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And we use this passage to say, we got to be cool. (laughs) We got to get rid of old traditions that don't help people understand Jesus. I know many of you have deceased grandparents or parents or brothers or sisters who love the old time religion. Come on. You got a grandpa that's like, you wear a suit to church is what you do. Right? They wore suits. They'd show up on Sunday in the morning and in the evening. They didn't sing songs with guitars. They sang those old hymns. Do you know what I'm talking about? They didn't dance. They didn't smoke. They didn't chew. They didn't go with those who do. <laughs> do you, you understand right, who I'm talking about? What was their translation? The authorized version. The King James version. And we think of it, oh, it was this stale 
thing. Like these, these, these guys, they had a stale traditional religion. They weren't relevant. They were distracting sometimes. They were maybe a little bit too critical and legalistic and they had a weird translation and they wore weird, weird things to church and the songs they sang were boring and the culture around them didn't understand them and time passed by them and they became relics of an older time and an older culture. And you know what's true about them right now? If they trusted in Jesus, they're in his presence. It didn't matter what they dressed like. So like that's true for them, right? And it's easy for us, I think, to hear that and also to say like, hey, like people who are doing the other stuff, the trendy stuff, it's true for them as well. Our church, years ago, used to look a little different. If you see old pictures, you see guys in really short OP shorts <laughs> sitting on the ground, fresh from the ocean, still smelling like the waves. <laughs> they went to church at weird times. There was lots of wild music. Alan has chilled out a lot over the years. <laughs> And so I wasn't a member of that generation. And I might look back and think, what weird things they did. But if they place their faith in Jesus, any of those who have departed from us are in his presence. The point I want to make is this. I'm afraid that passages like this are applied incorrectly. And they want to tell it, we want to tell people using these passages, got to get that new wine. That new wine that will attract people to Christ. And I'm saying, no, 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 that's, that's not what he's saying. He's saying there's one way to be saved. There are ways to apply this today that, that I think make sense to us, or are obvious to us. If you're a Christian, you cannot be a member of another religion. Christianity does not meld with Buddhism or Islam. I've had people claim that. It's not true. Christianity as a unifying belief, the gospel does not accommodate an all-encompassing political view, whatever that might be. Cultural associations. Do you guys like philosophy? That's so funny. Three services, dead silence every time. <laughs> do you guys like philosophy? We do not like philosophy. Mike has a degree in philosophy. <laughs> he is a philosopher. Here's the thing. Philosophy is right sometimes, but only because God was right first. I think philosophy is good. I think you should maybe study a little philosophy. Ask Mike, he'll help you. <laughs> but I can't possess a philosophical position or system of thought that's at odds with the gospel. It doesn't work that way. I think probably the most likely way that those of us here might need to hear this passage preached to us, ways that we actually want old wine when we should want new wine, when we're trying to put new wine in, in old, old wine skins, is that we might fall without even realizing it into a form of salvation that's works-based. Go to church on time and arrive on time and read your Bible the right amount and pray in many church and serve in various ways. And it's this ironic situation in which we have been given a perfect record of righteousness to present to the judge and yet we still obsess over our own record. Now, here's what I'm not saying. Hope Chapel, I'm not saying that holiness and righteousness and obedience is bad. It is very good. It is what people who have responded to the gospel grow in. It shows that we are saved, but it doesn't save us. And it's easy for us to fall into the trap of becoming good Christians and thinking, this is why I'm in, because God approves of me finally. He approves of you because you're in Christ. That's why he approves of you. So we have a new joy. We have a new exclusivity. And we also, lastly, have a new appetite. It's amazing that we've changed the service time, and I look up and see it's 1230, and I freak out. It's also the last service. I got all the time in the world. <laughs> Verse 39. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. Your translation might read, 
the old is better, or it might read the old is good enough. Jesus is saying something like this. We want the new wine that he's describing. The new wine has to go into new wineskins. And then he adds, but for some reason, people just kind of like old wine, even though the new wine is better. It's amazing to me how appetites work. I don't wake up in the morning deciding what I'm going to want. I just want or don't want that thing. Does that make sense when I say that? My son is on the uh, cheese pizza only diet. (laughs) Some wives are like, my husband is on that same diet. That's the diet you're on. You're going to die. You need to talk to somebody, okay? (laughs) Don't eat just cheese pizza. What's wild about appetites and modernity is how they're mismatched. I have an appetite for the wrong stuff. A great example is Doritos. Do you guys like Doritos? Few no's out there. A Dorito doesn't give me anything I need. Not really, right? I'll never go to a doctor and doctors say, you know what you need is more Doritos. <laughs> never going to happen. There's nothing of real nutritional value in a Dorito. The guys designing the Dorito are not saying we need to keep people healthy. They're thinking we need to keep people eating Doritos. That's the thing. You can eat one or you could eat 10,000. It's designed for you to continue to eat it. And you kind of want to eat a Dorito. I'm saying this right now and you're like, ugh. It's wild to me, it's wild to me that my appetite and your appetite is for something that actually won't sustain you. Do you see what I'm saying? The world we live in is made up of food that actually doesn't keep us healthy and and like we want to eat it, right? I go into 7-Eleven and I don't think, gotta hit my macros. (laughs) I think, man, what treat do I deserve today because it was a really bad day for traffic or whatever, right? Like we have an appetite for something that doesn't sustain us, an appetite that's something that doesn't actually keep us safe, that actually makes us healthy. If we eat according to our appetite only, we're going to die. Do you see how wild that is? It is true also spiritually, that we have an appetite naturally, not for what will save us, but for what will kill us. We actually want the old wine at first, not the new wine. There's this great example in the New Testament where Paul, you've heard of Paul, yeah? Yeah. Good. Paul is a missionary and he's going around and he's telling people about Jesus and they're converting and they're becoming Christians. He goes to the churches in Galatia and they convert to Christianity. He teaches them the gospel and then he leaves. He leaves to do more missions work. And while he's gone, these dorks come by and they find the Galatians. They say to the Galatians, do you believe in Jesus? And they're like, yes. And they're like, well, obviously you're also circumcised and abide by all Jewish law. And the Gentiles are like, I don't know what any of that is. I've just heard of Jesus. And they're like, well, it's good we came. Because you need to do all this stuff also. Someone came along and said, oh, you've heard of the new wine? Here are some old wineskins to put it in. And Paul hears about it. Paul, a famously chill human being, writes this letter to them. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Paul's saying there's just the one type of good news, the one gospel. Everything else is a lie. These guys who came in and said, Jesus saves you and also do these other things, let them be accursed. Then he continues, he says this in chapter 2, We ourselves, Paul now talking about himself and probably his companions, are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Kind of a wild thing to say in a letter to Gentiles. (laughs) Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in whom, guys? Jesus. Jesus Christ. 
It's wild. Paul gives them new wine, and some of them still have an appetite for old wine. They have the new, but they prefer the old. We read something even scarier than this, like, like, in, like in 2 Corinthians. We read, in their case, the God of this world, that is Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This can, in some sense, be a scary truth for us. The idea is this. I do not naturally choose my own appetite. I can eat at odds with my appetite, but I don't really choose it. Here's an example for you, and some of you will say, say yes to this, but don't say yes to this. When you were a kid, you probably did not like black coffee. Some of you weirdos did. <laughs> but most of you didn't. Is that right? I remember the first time I tried black coffee, I saw everyone walking around with mugs of coffee. I thought every adult was pranking me. There is no way. <laughs> There is no way that anyone would ever want to drink this. Then as you grow older, and life gets a little bit more burdensome and heavy, <laughs> one day you drink coffee and you're like, oh. How did, it, how did I ever live without you, coffee, right? <laughs> I didn't like work my way up to coffee. I didn't wake up every day and be like, I'm going to like coffee today. It happened to me. My appetite changed. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You certainly have people for whom you are praying that whether they know it or not, prefer the old wine and not the new. They still trust in themselves and not in Jesus. You have friends, and you have, you have family members, you have maybe spouses, you have parents. I know I've got four kids, and many of my friends have kids, and it's easy to obsess over their future, their spiritual future. Maybe you have older kids who have at least for a season gone their own way. It's, oh, it's a scary truth, they're like, they don't choose their own appetite. They don't choose their own appetite. They just have an appetite. And they need to be acted upon by an external force. And I want, I want to affirm for you why this is good news and not bad news. If we're on you to save those who are unsaved, you would fail every time. Without exception, you would fail. But that's not how it works. There are two truths that I rest in when I think about those who I love that do not love Jesus. The first is this. God desires for people to be saved. I think we can forget that sometimes. I can say that because the Bible says that. Peter says it. Do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach what? Repentance. Isn't it a wild fact, a wild truth that I can say God wants people to be saved? I am not saying that all will reach repentance. I'm saying that God desires that people reach repentance. Second, and as importantly, not only does God desire people to be saved, but unlike us, God is himself mighty to save. There's a million places I could go, but I'll just go to one, Psalm 68. Blessed be the Lord, who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Our God is a God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs deliverances from death. Pope Chapel, I know the, the anxiety and the fear around wanting people to be saved who are not saved. And I'm sure many of you know it as well, if not better, than I. And I want to encourage you and exhort you to rest in these truths. God desires sinners to repent, and God is able to save them. 
God can give a new appetite. It can happen miraculously. Amen? Father, we thank you for our time together today, this weekend. We thank you for Luke, who you sovereignly appointed to write this gospel. We thank you for kindly preserving it for us for these many thousands of years. We thank you for the hard work that goes into producing our Bibles and getting them into our hands. We thank you for everything that happens along the way so that we might have the very word of God to read. I pray as we continue to faithfully study it, that we would, in appropriate measure, be convicted, rebuked, encouraged, and uplifted. I thank you for this church and these people. I pray that we would grow to know you more, and in knowing you more, we would love you more. And in loving you more, we would glorify you better. We pray all these things in the great name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.